how will the next big scientific breakthrough happen? And potentially, what will it be about? Oh, very interesting. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull the first card and the way that I do readings, which are maybe different than how other people do readings, are that it's a kind of like Socratic process. So Alan will ask you what you see and then I'll help interpret it. And usually each card is kind of like a step along the way to answering that question of, um, can you repeat the question again? Because I've already forgotten. <laughs> uh, how will the next big scientific discovery happen and what will it be about? Yeah, so how's the next scientific discovery going to happen? What's it going to be about? We'll just go step by step and, and pull these three cards and tell a little story. So the first card is the justice card. <clears throat> so uh, traditionally, the justice card um, is, there are lots of different kind of symbols that you would see on the traditional justice card um, that show um, kind of scales or, or balance. Um, but here we've reinterpreted this, and Ellen, what's on this card? So this is uh, a combination of a few symbols. First you have uh, a galaxy at the center, and then you have all this kind of uh, life cycle of matter from like a black hole to a star to a supernova. Um, and then you have the Ouroboros, uh, the snake eating its own tail in the center. And all of that kind of says like conservation of energy. There's no more energy being created. It's all, the whole universe is in balance. Yeah, so the traditional um, tarot deck, or my major arcana have 22 cards, and this is actually the 11th card in the, in the cycle. It's circular, so where you start, you begin. Um, we, uh, Mateo chose the Ouroboros and, um, to draw on this card as a way of kind of symbolizing um, that, that balance of birth and death um, and also a sort of understanding that the, there are rules and laws that govern the way the universe works. Sometimes we understand them, sometimes we don't, but it's all in some kind of balance. Um, I think also traditionally what this card means is it's a kind of transitional card. It means that you're moving from a period of, um, you know, you're, you've gone over halfway through the cycle. You're moving into a period of new awareness and actually what happens first is being held to account for things. Um, and when you're being held to account, you're able to restore balance. So I think in terms of, you know, when is the next scientific big discovery gonna happen and how is it gonna happen? I think what we've witnessed in the past year is that um, there's a lot of things out of whack with the way in which we are engaging with the world as a species, with the natural world. Uh, we're very extractive. Things are really out of balance. I think climate change is in some ways a, just a symptom of um, our kind of unbalanced relationship with the world. So I think before what the cards are saying, but also what I think too, is that before anything can change or before we can discover anything that's new or revelatory, we have to remember that there is an inherent balance, um, you know, in the universe. Entropy is a real thing, um, and the more chaos we cause, um, the more we're going to have to exist within that space, and we will have to figure out a way to correct that. So I think that's kind of the first thing that has to happen. It's the first card. Um, and the second card, ah, this is one of my favorites. So this the is the hangman. Yeah. So I know you love this card too, Alan. What Can you tell us about what you see on this card? Yeah. So... Um... This is really depicting Schrodinger's cat and the idea of uncertainty. Like once you, you don't know whether the cat is alive or dead until you look inside the box. And uh, when the box is closed, it could be either or. Um, so it's really kind of the unknowability of the future, um, but also kind of within a prescribed set of outcomes. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think this one, this one is a really cool one, um, just as a little context too, when we were translating the original symbols of the tarot, which this is usually a kind of page figure that is hanging from a tree by his foot, so he's kind of trapped. Um, there's a lot of other symbols in the card too, but that's the primary one. Um, and uh, the card actually means a lot of different things, but is primarily about a kind of sacrifice. 
um, that one has to sacrifice oneself. Um, as you can see, this is the 12th card. So it actually directly follows the justice card. Might have been because I didn't shuffle the pack properly, but um, <laughs> but because uh, the previous card was 11. But um, this is a kind of next stage after sacrifice, right? Where, um, sorry, after um, a restoring a balance where you have to, in order to restore that balance, you do have to sacrifice some element of yourself or um, in the case of your question, Ellen, the process of science, there are some elements in, uh, of, or there's some aspects of how we conduct science, how we do research, how we extract natural resources from the world, um, how we systematically disadvantage certain people so that others can have more things. We're gonna have to, we're gonna have to change that. And we're gonna, some people are, who have a lot might have to sacrifice some things. But when we were translating the symbols, um, Schrodinger's cat of like sort of not uh, of, of an unknown of the uh, the sacrifice of of not knowing if you should be one way or another and having to make that decision also mapped nicely onto the idea of um, animals you know being sacrificing their lives in the scientific community for our the health of our species and our planet for a long time um, and now to this day animals are used in scientific labs and um, sacrifice their lives so that we can understand the world better. And so there are some nice like little um, uh, kind of parallels like that, that were nice in terms of how we were creating this symbolic allegory. But I would say that as a second step after restoring balance, we're gonna have to make some kind of sacrifices that, um, that expose, I think this like unknown, this duality um, that Schrodinger's cat shows us. Okay, so the next one. So this is in a traditional three card pull, the three, the third card that you pull out um, is kind of like the conclusion of the story. So we have, we have rest restoration of balance being called to account for things that um, have thrown things out of balance, some kind of sacrifice um, of perhaps a traditional way of doing things in terms of like science and, and what our next step is. And then we have the moon card. Um, and so this is the 18th card in the um, in the the cycle of the major arcana. And Alan, what do you see on this one? So here I see um, kind of two separate paths to the same goal. I see the space race and the the Apollos on one side and the cosmonauts on the other. And uh, that's really interesting to me because knowing how they both had the same goal in mind, but the whole space programs of the US and the USSR took really different approaches and had different values and had different outcomes. Um, so for this, the kind of, and also the split right down the middle, the kind of balance of it tells me that there's not just one, one way to get to that point. There's multiple different, multiple different strategies. Yeah, and um, the the really cool thing about tarot cards is there's essentially infinite symbols in every card, and this was <laughs> this was a fun part of making these um, was watching Matteo go down a rabbit hole of understanding and sort of assessing every little piece of um, every symbol in every tarot card, and there are infinite sort of interpretations of those cards. Very famously, the um, film director Alexander Jodorowsky got very into esoteric tarot cards. You know, made um, a, has written a number of books about cards and symbols, has remade one of the original tarot decks, um, and every single thing—the way that a foot, a, a direction, a foot um, is placed, whether or not there's water, sky, earth um, in every card. Um, directionality is really important all sorts of different things. So when he was reinterpreting the original moon card um, and made this card, he he really considered all of that. So Alan noted the stream coming from the sky and bringing water down, um, which in traditional tarot is interpreted as uh, emotions, um, cups and water uh, are kind of emotional realm. Um, the sky realm is an intellectual realm, which we have here. We have the moon and uh, uh, both phases of different phases of the moon. Here he interpreted it as a kind of space race, but there's also a lot of the traditional elements that are still in this card that you would see in the traditional moon card. Um, the moon card traditionally means like facing yourself, 
um, there's some kind of illusion or misunderstanding and you're forced to kind of reckon with that. Um, and the need to face ourselves and to look at ourselves and to consider in this case, you know, there was a space race, but it was just humans who were really racing themselves to discover something. Um, is that race necessary? Do we need to construct a kind of warlike um, dynamic in order to achieve something or in order to understand more about the world or discover more about the world? I think that kind of self-reckoning is the final stage before the next big uh, discovery. And I think we're like kind of in the midst of this right now. I mean, we have another space race happening. Um, uh, and I would say there's probably not a lot of self introspection amongst the folks who are driving that space race. Um, <laughs> they're not really looking at themselves to understand whether, you know, why they're doing that, who gets to benefit from it. Um, uh, and you know, a lot of other things. So I would say that this is the kind of final stage before, um, before that can actually happen in a way that, that is, you know, that it, it, this is what needs to happen before there is a scientific discovery that can really benefit us all. Um, that's what I would say. So I think this is a nice conclusion to that three card reading. Oh, thank you. That was great. I should warn you, Nadia, before you put away the cards, that one of our questions in the Q&A is another reading. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Someone wants to know, and I know you're going to love this question, when will the pandemic end? <laughs> oh, God. Oh, that's, um, that's a good one. Should we do, we can do one more. If we have time. Yeah. Well, we have another 25 minutes, right? Is that yeah, we do. We do. So we have time, just if you want to. Cool. So I'm just going to try to shuffle them in. Okay. So um, when will the pandemic end? <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't hold me to this reading. <laughs> Remember, it's also just a way to tell a story about this experience that we've all collectively experienced this year, which makes a lot of sense because the first card that comes up is the tower card. Um, anybody who's familiar with traditional tarot knows that this is kind of, I think, well, I think is one of the more fun cards because it really has these dueling meanings. Um, so Hannah, what do you see in this card? A lot of spooky symbolism. <laughs> is that an eye at the top of the tower? <laughs> like the eye of Sauron or um, the pyramid on the dollar bill? Um, I see a king in a boat mm -hmm. and I see someone drowning, probably a peasant. <laughs> so that sounds about right. <laughs> there's also, there's also um, a lot of, uh, you know, rain or weather coming down. It's a pretty like apocalyptic scene. There's smoke coming in the background. The tarot card traditionally symbolizes like total destruction, um, uh, like an annihilation card. Um, and I like the tower card a lot because oftentimes um, you can't have growth without destruction. Um, I think that's a complicated way of, uh, or it's a complicated card, uh, can mean lots of things. You can have growth without destruction, but oftentimes destruction leads to growth afterwards is a better way of thinking about it. So I think what we've all experienced collectively this year with the pandemic is just an un believable amount of loss and sadness and death. Um, a lot of it was not necessary. Um, we're being forced to see that right now. And through this destruction that's happened over the, the past year, um, I think we have some new insight. And I think that, you know, after this, this destruction, there will be growth. That's the hope. There can be. There also cannot be. Um, but I think, um, you know, what we're seeing here is is power um, and those around that power not being able to, to be saved. Um, and so what, what Matteo did with this card in particular um, as a kind of interpretation of the original sort of tower card um, being destroyed is this is a little bit like an academic tower card where we have those in power in elite people in a sort of academic sense dictating what happens outside in this kind of all-knowing way, which is utterly destructive. So um, this is like the ivory tower a little bit, but... Um, yeah, it is almost ivory. <laughs> I get that symbolism. 
So that's the first card. And then in the second card, we have the Wheel of Fortune. Um, Wheel of Fortune is a, an interesting card. It's um, in this case, this is uh, uh, at CERN here, we have the Large Hadron Collider, um, which is a really beautiful, I think, um, metaphor for uh, what is traditionally shown as an actual kind of Wheel of Fortune um, with all of the zodiac symbols, the sort of um, progression of, of uh, the, the human spirit throughout um, its cycle. Um, and I think here is represented like the capacity for humans to really create one of the the most unbelievable. I've actually been to CERN before and I have never seen anything like it in my life. I don't understand how we created we created it. I know we did it, but it seems it's spiritually profound to see what humans can do when they really put their minds to it. Um, and so I think out of that destruction comes the capacity for us to come full circle um, and to really understand how complex the world is and how to how to end this thing that has caused so much destruction. But it really requires, I mean, Large Hadron Collider has required, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of people to come together in a peaceful way to um, to try to understand some very simple things about how the universe works. I think we have to do the same thing to, to transcend this pandemic. We all have to come together in, in that way. That I think probably the field of physics, although it's problematic, conceptually has, has done the best um, on a large scale. Um, and then, this is a good one. This is the final card of the three card pull. I love this card. It's a woman doing her best at the, I think probably like a smelter, um, working a really hard job uh, to transform kind of materials from the world into something that, um, you know, gives us more strength. She's strong. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of different fields right now um, in, um, in and around the idea of climate awareness and planetary health and mental health around um, uh, our relationship with the, the natural world. I think those are gonna get, those are gonna become bigger and bigger fields as we understand how important it is for human beings to, um, to sort of mentally grieve things and become stronger through a sort of psychological process of self-awareness. Um, we're losing a lot of the environment. We've lost a lot of our own species. You know, we've, we've witnessed and been a part of a lot of death. Um, and I think we, we need to build our strength um, by being more self-aware and, and, um, and coming together. So that's the kind of, that's the reading for uh, when the pandemic is gonna end. I don't have a specific answer, but, but hopefully that was helpful for one of the audience members. Yeah, I think that uh, industrial image for that card is really interesting because I, I think for this particular reading, you know, there have been a lot of innovations because of the pandemic. So that that gives me some hope that <laughs> that might bring us out of it. Um, thank you for that. That was really fun. I wish we could do that all day, but it would probably take forever. Um, so we have some more questions that are not reading questions. Um, the first question is from Lee Fury. Um, I love the concept of using major scientific concepts for the major arcana. Can you talk about that decision process? Yeah, Alan, do you want to talk a little bit about that? or I... uh, You take it because you were pretty involved in, you're pretty deeply involved in that. So you can speak to more detail. Yeah, I mean, I think there's multiple levels on which you can look at the scientific processes that we represent in, in the, the transformation, but just to kind of like start from the very beginning, um, you know, the fool card, for example, is supposed to be the kind of most naive state of awareness. You're happy and joyful because you don't know any better. And you're just going out into the world and starting to, to kind of experience the world. So there's not, there's not really a lot going on there, but there's also a huge benefit to being the fool in as much as um, you don't experience as much kind of pain, things like that. That's a traditional reading. When we translated that to our major arcana, we, we uh, looked at this particular moment in evolutionary history where um, animals were leaving the sea and coming to land. 
it's this like new moment, a new world. They didn't, you know, this this evolutionary process, which obviously took you know, many millions of years, is still this, um, I think, really nice uh, parallel or sits in parallel to the traditional fool card, where we have this creature that is really discovering a world for the first time, hasn't necessarily evolved for land yet, um, which is a long process. Um, and so trying to understand like, what are the benefits and, and costs of being in the fool state? What does this card mean? Um, that's kind of how we did that translation process between the traditional cards and the, um, the women of science tarot cards for the major arcana. Same thing goes for also one of my favorite cards, which is the devil card. <laughs> um, don't have to tell probably anybody, uh, you know, what these signs mean, but we have, um, this is a particularly relevant one, I think, for scientists. We have the, the devil holding the stopwatch in a money bag, publisher perish beneath, um, and uh, these kind of chained um, figures uh, beneath the devil who are holding up some tools of of science, but are really at the end of the day chained to to uh, time and money and publishing. Um, I think you know the devil in a traditional deck represents all of the you know controlling, um, powerful uh, sort of modes of being that are really destructive. And I think the same goes in science. We don't often recognize the violence that you know time and money um, present to the scientific process. Uh, oftentimes, it's kind of hidden but it's there and it's important to recognize. So, so we, we, we did, there was a lot of that for all of the different cards, but I think the idea was we were trying to also map the same allegorical kind of transformation from, um, from the fool all the way to, to an understanding, a holistic understanding of the whole world, which is one of, <clears throat> excuse me, one of my favorite cards. <coughs> um, and this world card is, in contrast to the the uh, fool card, is the kind of culmination of our holistic understanding of how the world works. You know, in this case, scientifically, um, we have this beautiful person in the middle who is a combination of different augmented, um, abled uh, spaces who is understanding and looking at the world and engaging with it and changing it as it changes her. So. Um, so yeah, that's that's how we did it. And one thing I'll add to that is um, we don't have time to go into all of them here, but we do provide a lot of those same readings in uh, the first 20 or so pages of the guidebook. We explain the scientific concepts as well as the more traditional tarot ones. Mm 